on World News Tonight. Trump charge. Ex-President Donald Trump indicted in Georgia over bid to reverse 2020 election loss. Massive fires. Dozens reported dead in explosion and fire at fuel station in southern Russia. Detrimental barge. UK evacuates migrants aboard controversial migrant barge following health and safety fears. Starry skies. Streaks of light from the Perseid meteor shower delight stargazers across the globe. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are joining us on World News. We start up tonight with grim updates on the deadly landslide in India. Torrents of rain in India's Himalayas triggered landslides that have killed over 50 people, with the death toll expected to rise as more than 20 remain trapped or missing. Landslides triggered by torrential rains in India's Himalayas have left dozens dead and more trapped or missing, officials said on Monday. Footage from India's neighboring Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand states showed houses flattened by landslides and buses and cars hanging on the edge of precipices after roads gave way. Hundreds congregated at rescue sites as emergency workers struggled to clear the debris. Here in Shimla, Himachal Pradesh, worshippers had gathered at a temple when a landslide struck and it collapsed, said Nafis Khan, an inspector with the National Disaster Response Force. Rescue workers traveled from a city three hours away to begin the task of freeing the estimated 30 to 35 people still trapped. In Uttarakhand, rescue efforts were being hampered by the ongoing monsoon. This is the state's chief minister, Pushkar Singh Dami. A lot of the damage has been inflicted due to active monsoon in the past 48 hours. Bridges have collapsed, roads have been washed away, and roads are also blocked at many places. I have surveyed the situation and we will try our best to restore normalcy as soon as the monsoon slows down. Parts of Himachal and Uttarakhand received as much as 16.5 inches of rain in 24 hours on Sunday and Monday, the India Meteorological Department said. It issued a red alert for the states, forecasting that the intensity of the rainfall would reduce from Tuesday onwards. Meanwhile, in the U.S., prosecutors have charged former U.S. President Donald Trump with trying to overturn his 2020 election loss in the U.S. state of Georgia in the most damning indictment so far against the former president at a time where he already is facing three other cases. President Trump! He's the former president already three times indicted. In New York. 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. We love Trump! In Miami. Violations of our national security laws. And in Washington, D.C. Conspiring to defraud the United States. Indictment number four in Fulton County, Georgia, comes with a soundtrack. I just want to find 11,780 votes. The Donald Trump phone call is at the heart of this case. The people of Georgia are angry. The people of the country are angry. A president's appeal for votes he didn't have in an election he didn't win. A criminal enterprise, according to Georgia's district attorney. To accomplish the illegal goal of allowing Donald J. Trump to seize the presidential term of office beginning on January 20th, 21. The plot was laid out in the paperwork hand carried through court building corridors. The admin of indicting a former president, now routine. U.S. political history isn't what it used to be. Thank you. The indictment tells of the Trump phone call amidst demonstrations, counts and recounts in Georgia. Joe Biden won the state in 2020, but Donald Trump called it Secretary of State. If we could just go over some of the numbers. He wanted the result reversed in his favor. The election official resisted. I just want to find 11,780 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. Georgia has leveled racketeering charges against Donald Trump, a prosecution tool typically used to tackle mafia crime. The dawn in this racket is joined by 18 others. They include his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and former personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani. 
Now on to updates of the massive fire in Dagestan, southern Russia, where at least 30 people, including three children and more than 100 others, were injured. The fire started at an auto repair shop on the roadside of a highway in Dagestani capital, Makachla, which is located on the Caspian Sea and caused blast spreading to the nearby petrol station. Russia's emergency ministry reported that a total of 105 people were injured and 30 people had died. Dagestan's governor, Sergei Melkov, said that amongst the dead were three children. He further stated that the reasons and type of the explosion are being clarified. Furthermore, Russia's Emergency Situations Ministry said an aircraft had also been dispatched to Moscow to evacuate the most seriously injured to Moscow. The ministry further said that the fire spread over an area of approximately 600 square meters, adding that 265 fighters were deployed. It had reported that we have taken firefighters more than three and a half hours to put out the fire. Now over in Hawaii, the death toll from the devastating wildfires in Maui has risen to 99 with authorities warning the figure could double in the coming days. The death toll from the Maui wildfires, the deadliest U.S. wildfires in more than 100 years, continues to rise. Hawaii Governor Josh Green told the media on Monday local time that the death toll is likely to double in the next 10 days. This comes a day after he toured the wildfire damage on Maui. Families will come together, but there's a lot of loss here. And I think we're going to see significantly higher numbers uh, in the coming days as our professionals from FEMA and, and Maui Fire Police do their job. The total number of people that are missing or unaccounted for is still unknown as the harsh conditions such as the heat have made it difficult for cadaver dogs and rescue crews to conduct search and recovery operations. This is going to require every tool that we have in our toolbox. We are not going to be able to rely on all of the traditional programs that we do in the continental United States. As the death toll continues to go up, officials are facing criticism regarding their preparation and their handling of the deadliest wildfires in over a century. Hawaii's outdoor siren warning system, the largest in the world with around 400 alarms, was not activated during the fires. Other alert systems were instead activated, such as mobile phone alerts and messages on televisions and radio stations, which many deemed to be insufficient. Just from our parking stall, to the entrance of our apartment complex. It went from blue skies to gray to black. And all we seen was embers from fire that we had no idea what's going on. There was no siren, nothing. There is also a lawsuit filed against Hawaii Electric that alleges that the fires were caused by the utility company failing to shut off the power lines that were knocked down by strong winds. The blaze devastated the town of Lahaina on Maui's west coast, damaging or destroying more than 2,200 structures. Recovery efforts are focused on providing direct aid that will help displaced residents temporarily move into hotels and motels, as well as grants for basic necessities such as food, water and medical supplies. Italy's Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni has taken full responsibility for the controversial decision to impose a one-off windfall tax on banks, which she described as her own, but concluded her statement with an assertive remark saying that she would do it again. Italy's Prime Minister said she took full responsibility for the shock decision to impose a one-off bank tax. Last week, Italy set the surprise 40% tax on profits gained from higher interest rates. The announcement has been blamed for hurting the government's credibility with financial markets. But Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney was defiant on Monday and said she would do it again. Maloney told three leading Italian newspapers the levy was not intended to punish lenders. Italy's Conservative government unveiled the unexpected decision late last Monday to shore up its political base. But it partly backtracked by clarifying there was a cap on proceeds 24 hours later. And it also came after having changed the threshold to apply the tax in the meantime. It targets a rise in profits banks have derived from higher rates. Rome's communication over the issue has also caused alarm among international investors. Sources told the Treasury expected to draw less than $3.3 billion from the tax. But before there was clarification on the cap, Calculations suggested much higher sums. 
We'll be back with more world news of this short commercial break. Welcome back. People in Niger are feeling the pinch from sanctions imposed by the economic community of West African states in response to a military coup in the country, which have resulted in longer power cuts amid several other restrictions. Capital city Niamey was no stranger to blackouts even before the coup. But over the past two weeks, the situation has worsened. As part of the ECOWAS sanctions designed to put pressure on the coup leaders, neighboring Nigeria stopped selling electricity to Niger. The country relied on this supply for 70% of its power needs. As you can see, due to the power cuts, the children are outside. Because it's too hot inside, we've set up mosquito nets for them outdoors. These long outages lasting a whole day or even just four hours are also hitting the shopkeepers who sell fresh items. Many fresh products no longer reach Niamey. The border closures with Benin and Nigeria, two major trade routes for Niger, is hampering the country's economy. The prices of most imported goods have already gone up, often by over 20%. ECOWAS hasn't fixed anything. The leaders of ECOWAS, in fact, don't want to fix anything for us workers. But they can go ahead and do whatever they want, impose even harsher sanctions. We don't care. In Niamey, critics are pointing fingers at what they consider a strategic misstep by the regional organization. All these measures, they're only targeting the population. The people are suffocating. Niger won't collapse. We have oil. On Thursday, ECOWAS leaders met in Abuja in Nigeria and decided to uphold economic sanctions. They've also given the green light to activate the organization's standby force for a potential military move in Niger. Less than a week after making the big move, the UK government has reportedly removed all 39 migrants off the controversial and life-endangering migrant barge on health and safety fears. As the number of migrants crossing the channel grows, the barge to house them remains empty. 39 asylum seekers were evacuated on Friday night after just a few days following an outbreak of Legionella bacteria. Now in hotels, those who were on board are speaking out. We bathe with it, we drink it, he said. I feel so bad, especially because on the news they said they took water samples, but instead of waiting by for the result before putting people on there, they just put us on there. It's like we don't matter. They should have been so sure it is habitable. Why not wait for the result and be sure everything is OK? We are being treated like less than animals. They are endangering us. I'm worried about becoming ill. Here I'm alone. I don't have family. Telling us about what it was like on the barge, he said, For me, it's small, like being on a prison, because the security is too much. There's no freedom. For me, I have a fear of water. I can't swim. Me being on water, my heart palpitates. I can't sleep. There remains, too, confusion over who knew what and when when it comes to the Legionella test results. On Tuesday, the 25th of July, Dorset Council took water samples from the barge and sent them to the UK Health Security Agency. Dorset Council received initial results last Monday. The first 15 asylum seekers boarded the Bibby Stockholm on the same day. The council say they verbally informed Home Office officials the next day. But it wasn't until Wednesday that the UK Health Security Agency was informed and the Home Office given written notification. On Thursday, a meeting between all relevant agencies concluded that no more people should be moved onto the barge. But 39 people already on board were not evacuated until Friday, four days after the initial discovery. As work to make the Bibby safe continues, more migrants make the dangerous journey. Today we saw more than 100 being brought in on a border force vessel. I don't think the answer to this is barges, is hotels, massive costs, £6 million a day, air bases. Um, that's, that's the symptom. The problem is that the government hasn't done enough work to break the gangs that are running this trade, this vile trade, and to process the applications. And so the government has made a complete and utter mess. Downing Street says the Prime Minister still has confidence in the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, and insists the Home Office acted quickly. 
Not quickly enough, according to some of those on board who have questions about returning to the barge if and when it's made safe. Tonight's segment on the road to the White House. Now, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s campaign is once again in damage control mode after the Democratic primary contender appeared to come out in support of a national abortion ban after three months into a pregnancy. He offered the latest sign that his views more closely aligned with Donald Trump and the Republican Party and told in an interview with no signs of misunderstanding the question that he thought abortion should be legal during the first three months of life. Later, his campaign claimed that the candidate had not meant what he had said. Abortion rights have become a more relevant issue than ever before, with the Supreme Court station scrapping Roe v. Wade in 2022. The issue was one of several reasons blamed for the GOP's poor performance in the contests, with the party losing ground to the incumbent president's party in the Senate and barely eking out a tiny majority in the House. Were Mr. Kennedy to formally endorse a national abortion ban after any time period, it would set him apart from every single prominent politician in the party of which he claims to want to lead. The running mate of Ecuador's assassinated presidential candidate, Fernando Vival Avanciado, have been named to stand in his place in the August elections. The centrist council party said in a statement that Andrea Gonzalez will replace the 59-year-old leader who was shot dead last week after leaving a campaign event in the capital, Quito. An unexpected change of electoral plan for Ecuador's opposition. After the assassination of its presidential candidate Fernando Villavicencio, the Build Ecuador movement had planned on his running mate Andrea Gonzalez replacing him in next Sunday's snap election, but instead she announced that the candidate would be someone else. The candidate we have decided on in an agreement with Build Ecuador party is Christian Zurita, Fernando Villavicencio's brother in the struggle. He will accompany me not to let the timing of the National Electoral Council be a reason for disqualification and to fulfil the dream not only of Fernando Villavicencio, but of all of us who believe in him. The reason for the change was the slow response from the National Electoral Council regarding Gonzalez's proposed candidacy. I could not allow his political project to be lost by the National Electoral Council through a possible dismissal of his candidacy. Fernando Villavicencio's project is intact and I had to fight for it. Like the late Villavicencio, Christian Zarita is both a former legislator and an investigative journalist with a track record of exposing corruption. Via Vicencio was shot dead after a campaign rally in the capital Quito on Wednesday. Six suspects, all Colombian nationals accused of links to criminal groups, have been charged with the murder and remain in custody. Adolfo Macias, the leader of Los Choneros, one of Ecuador's most powerful gangs, was also transferred to a maximum security section of one of Guayaquil's main prisons. Via Vicencio's widow has accused the Ecuadorian government of failing to ensure her husband's safety, even as he was under the protection of a government security detail. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care on the world in a minute. India gears up to celebrate its 77th Independence Day. In 2023, India will mark 76 years of freedom from British colonial rule, a significant milestone for the country. Russian missiles hit Lviv, leaving more than 100 residential houses damaged, 500 windows broken and a kindergarten playground destroyed. Lviv city had been sparred much of Russia's air attacks until July, when seven people were killed by a missile that slammed into a residential building near the historic centre. Neymar is set to complete a move to the Saudi Pro League after Al Hilal agreed a reported 90 million euro transfer fee from Paris Saint Germain. Indonesia's National Rescue Agency released footage of rescuers searching for a group that went missing in bad weather off the coast of Aceh province. Four Australian surfers who were among the group have been found alive. 
but one of three Indonesian crew members remains missing. According to a statement issued by the Egyptian presidency, the leaders of Egypt, Jordan and Palestine stressed the necessity of ending the Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands in order to revive peace and the Palestinian cause. This year, tensions between Israel and Palestine have intensified, leading to clashes and significant casualties between the Israeli military and Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, West Bank and Jerusalem. That is all we have for you on World News tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving tonight as streaks of light from the Perseid meteor shower were visible in skies across the Balkans overnight to the delight of stargazers. Thank you for watching. Good night.